Ableton Live is a creative program that millions of musicians, including myself, use on a daily basis. In recent years, it's become one of, if not the most popular digital audio workstation, especially within the electronic music genre. How did this prolific program get to where it is today? Here during the release of Ableton Live 11, I hope to find some of these answers by looking back into its long history. So a little backstory on me, I've been using Ableton Live since version 8 on my old Power Mac G5. And I've been teaching Ableton on my YouTube channel since around 2012, 2013. I'm sure many of you have seen some of those videos over the years. And while I've had a pretty decent exposure to the program and know a thing or two about its inner workings and some of its history, Something happened a few months ago that made me want to learn a lot more about its history and development process. If you enjoy this video, consider supporting the channel for as little as $5 a month over on Patreon. It helps me make new videos and new content for you guys week after week. Click on the card in the upper right hand corner for more information. So one day while scrolling through Facebook market, like I'm sure all of us do, I found a lot of inbox old Apple laptops. Now anyone who knows me can attest, I'm a bit of a vintage and outdated tech nerd. I pick up old game consoles, video games, computers, you name it. I'm also a huge Apple and Steve Jobs fan. I love their ethos, I love their brand and their brand identity and the history of the company. So I couldn't resist the urge to pick up these laptops. So trying to justify this purchase of these old Apple laptops that are pretty much good for nothing outside of just collector's items, I wanted to do something special with old software that you could only run on these old power PC machines. Now if you've purchased or owned Ableton in the past, you may have noticed that on the website there's a section that's essentially download links for every version of Live version 1 through 11. And shortly after buying these laptops, it occurred to me while trying to conceptualize a project I could do with them, that I might be able to get old versions of Ableton running on them. And my mind started to spin and I really, really wanted to get this to work because of this epiphany I had that I don't think anybody's ever tried this. So I went to the download page and my naive self thought, if I have a license for version nine, eight, 10 or 11, I'm sure that it'll activate, you know, version one through eight and I couldn't be more wrong. So I downloaded all of the versions of Live on these old power books, and to my detriment, I couldn't figure out how to activate them. So I went on the forums and I tried to get, you know, old serial numbers from users that used to use these ancient versions of Ableton, but to no avail, I couldn't even find them on eBay. So I reached out to a friend over on the Ableton team, and I've had the fortunate enough experience to be friends with the team that runs their American division for a few years now. Shout out to Miles over at Ableton Tech Support. He's been a longtime friend of mine even before he was at Ableton, and he's been supporting me for as long as I can remember. I basically emailed them back and forth, and they got with Tech Support and managed to grant me a license for every single version of Ableton with the exception of version 1, 2, and 3, the activation process for those is very different, so I couldn't manage to get those activated. But versions 4 through 11, I have a activation for. And we're going to take a look at all of these old versions of Ableton on these machines and track the developmental process of the software. We'll get into that shortly, but I thought it would be a good idea to contextualize this story of Ableton Live's development by first telling the story of Ableton's formation and some of its founders. So I don't know that I'm the most qualified to talk about the history of Ableton and its formation and development, so I reached out to some friends at Ableton for an interview. Their marketing director here in North America, David, is a longtime friend of mine. He's been supporting the channel ever since I was a kid making Ableton videos. And unfortunately, he let me know that everyone working at Ableton right now, or anyone that can answer this question I have, is incredibly busy, rightfully so, with the launch of Ableton Live 11. But he did provide some excellent insight, resources, and information about its developmental history. And I'm gonna do the best I can to explain this story with the information he provided. But if a real interview is something that you're interested in, let me know in the comments and we might be able to make it happen in a future video as work slows down on Ableton Live 11 and we have a little bit more time to talk. 
Also, apologies in advance if I mispronounce anyone's name. I'm not a native German speaker, so I'm trying my best here. So let's start from the beginning, or in this case, before the beginning. To set the stage, the late 90s was an era where digital audio was just coming into its own. DAWs of the time were unrecognizable from their modern counterparts, with many parts of the recording process to create electronic music segmented into different programs. For example, eMagic's Logic before Apple's acquisition of it, and Steinberg's Cubase were largely for MIDI sequencing of hardware instruments. Other DAWs included Sonic Foundry's Acid Pro before Sony's acquisition of it, Cakewalk, and the ever-popular Pro Tools, one of the best implementations of DSP at the time, reserved for larger studios and bigger projects. Ableton's co-founders Garrett Bellis and Robert Henke hated each other upon their initial interactions until years later when they both chance moved to Berlin and had a chance meeting at a lecture at Berlin's Technical University. Garrett describes this encounter in a previous interview when he said, I was sitting one day in the university at the introductory lecture. I hear this voice behind me asking a question and I go, no, that's Robert, he's here. And then Robert replied to the interviewer saying, in a totally cliche way, I was at this time this kind of totally lost goth punk person and Garrett pretty much looked the same as he does now. A nice white scarf and a very stable demeanor, like the type of people I hated at school. I ran up the auditorium to the exit and said, what the fuck are you doing here? It was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. There's a lot more to this interview about the history of dance music in Berlin through the 90s, these two's relationship to it and the profound impact they left on not only the Berlin electronic music scene, but electronic music as a whole. And if that's something that you're intrigued by, I definitely encourage checking out the article yourself. It's a great read. Again, that is in the description below. So fast forward a bit and Bellis and Henke were performing together as a forward-thinking music duo by the name of Mono Lake, writing applications out of necessity to accomplish the ideas in their shows that they couldn't achieve with the tools available to them at the time. It's astounding to me that these guys wrote the basis of the software we use every day just out of sheer necessity through creative willpower. They wanted to do something in a live performance that couldn't be done, so they created programs that would do it, and that's what the foundation of Ableton was built upon. In the late 90s, the pair had a monumental moment in the history of Ableton's development when they met a fellow programmer by the name of Bernd Rogendorf while working at Native Instruments, and he encouraged them to turn the software that ran their live shows, at the time a jumbled mess of patched together code, into something more substantial, commercially available, and a retail software product that other artists could use in their own live sets. Henke explains again in that aforementioned interview, I think the feeling we had was that there was enough like-minded people in our closer community who could appreciate a product like this, and that it would work commercially. That gave us confidence to believe that a small company could actually survive on the market. No one thought of the thing exploding. And with that, in 1999, Bellis left Monolake to concentrate on the development of Ableton Live, and the Ableton company was founded around this time also in 1999. Henke actually still uses the Mono Lake alias to this day as a solo act, uh, in addition to contributions to Ableton over the years. This brings us to the first version of Ableton Live, version 1, officially released on October 30th, 2001. And to start things off, I think the most appropriate machine I can install a 2001 program on is this cute iBook G3, also from 2001. Unfortunately, I don't have a good method to screen capture from this machine as the video outports are very antiquated and hard to find adapters for. So for most of the videos you'll see of these old versions of Ableton will be recorded on my much newer 2005 PowerBook G4. Ableton Live version one was largely thought of as a live performance tool and didn't make huge waves with the studio producer crowd initially, but it did catch the attention of many specifically for its industry leading implementation of real-time audio stretching, its session arrangement view options, effectively a recording platform for recording your jam sessions on arrangement view, 
that you could just turn around and edit to your heart's content, then put back around into session view to play again as a totally new performance idea. Live One supported VST audio effects, but notably omitted MIDI capabilities, and therefore any MIDI instruments or MIDI effects. So unfortunately, as you see on the screen here, Live One is the only version of Live that doesn't have a demo function, meaning if you don't have a serial number, you can't get past the initial dialog box. I thought I'd put it in the corner and kind of show you what the DAW looks like at the very least so you can see what Ableton One and its humble foundations actually looked like, but not much we can do past that. The design language of Live One and its subsequent two and three releases feature the Aqua design scheme in its logo, introduced by Steve Jobs around the same time. Reminds me a lot of early QuickTime and Mac OS X releases, a design scheme I'm incredibly nostalgic for, I'm sure a lot of you are. It's worth noting that the big software companies didn't take Live seriously at first because of the reliability of a laptop being required on stage. In Henke's own words, a laptop on stage, you must be crazy, or this interface looks horrible, were reactions we got often. However, we are now one of the most successful music software companies out there with an incredible number of customers all over the world and our software massively changed the way electronic music is created and performed. Around the release of Live One, Hanka recalled the first trade show where they showcased Ableton Live. I remember when we went to the first trade show with the first version of Live. A few people came by, but it was as if the world noticed the revolution was going to happen. At some point, a guy came by, just a typical LA music producer with a dark suit and kind of longish, slightly grayish hair, followed by maybe 10 people in their early 20s who also looked like the classic cliche of the Hollywood composer. I showed him the product and he had a German accent, but I didn't take note of that because at a trade show you meet all kinds of people, and I was too busy explaining to him what the product was all about. He had a lot of intelligent questions, and at some point he asked, so you can just put in a drum loop here and change the tempo continuously from let's say 110 to 140 BPM and it doesn't change the pitch. And I said, yeah, sure, I can show you. But I did it from 30 to 999 BPM. After that demo, he just said, do you have a card? Do you have information material? So I handed him my material and only then did I get to read his name tag. It was Hans Zimmer. Hans told us, you have something interesting here. And I really believe he was the first one who understood this piece of software could actually work in a completely different area than what we were assuming. Versions 2 and 3 are largely incremental updates with a few minor feature additions. I think the main focus of these versions was fine-tuning the formula of Live to make it as optimal and flawless as possible. Version 2 was released on December 22, 2002 and introduced multi-track recording, tap tempo, and an arm record button per track to utilize the new multi-track recording function. Version 2 also added the ability to save and recall effects presets, majorly improved upon automation, and introduced the track launch buttons to the session view. One of the things that I found really astounding when I was diving into Live 2, because I couldn't get into 1, obviously, is how little the plugins have actually changed. If you look at some of the devices, they're actually almost verbatim the versions that you find in Live 10 or 11. I thought that was really interesting. When version 3 released on October 10th, 2003, it introduced individual clip envelopes, MIDI mapping of computer keys, the iconic utility device, EQ3 for live performance, and the famous Resonator plugin that's been with it since 2003. Just for fun and to contextualize the age of the software, the minimum RAM requirement for Live 3 was 256 megabytes on Mac OS, with version 2 only requiring 128 megabytes. At the time, this was not an insubstantial amount of memory. I remember having a gateway computer with 64 megs of RAM. I never thought I'd be sitting here in 2021 complaining about eight gigabytes of memory being a small amount. So live version 4 is where things really start to get interesting. It's also ironically the first version of live that I have activated. So from here I thought it'd be fun if I tried saving a project file with a few things contained with it 
and then tried to open that file in every subsequent version of Live, adding the new features as we go along. So to start things off, Ableton Live 4 was launched almost a year after its previous iteration, nine months later on July 28, 2004, and was the biggest overhaul on the Ableton formula since its inception. This version brought so many improvements, it's almost hard to count them all, but a few notable ones include the much needed MIDI support, including sequencing, MIDI clips, software instruments, and then a ton of built-in devices such as the two sampler plugins, Impulse, which is a drum sampler that supports up to eight samples, and Simpler, which is, as you know, a melodic sampler. They also integrated MIDI I.O. for external devices, MIDI effects to influence incoming and programmed MIDI control data before reaching the instrument or subsequent audio chain, and follow actions were also added to session view to make your live sets easier and more automated. Looking back at it, Ableton Live 4 is a huge step up from 1 through 3, and I think it shares a lot of common DNA with the newest versions of Live. A lot of the newer features that they've integrated over the years have made its way into this version in some way or another. It also looks a lot more like the newer DAWs. The UI layout and some of the pull-down menus are very similar. I think this is where Ableton really started to take shape. So starting here in Live 4, I'm starting this project file called Live Set Through the Ages, which I think is appropriate. We're gonna try to open this in every subsequent version and see how much things change. Version 5 was released almost a year on the dot from its previous counterpart on July 24th, 2005. This version added MP3 support, several effects including the phaser and flanger, added an effective bounce in place feature referred to as freezing tracks within live, something that any producer on an underpowered computer today can appreciate. And amongst other things, added the MIDI arpeggiator effect, in my opinion, one of, if not the most functional and useful of all the included MIDI effects in Ableton today. Ableton Live version 6 was introduced September 26, 2006, and was an interesting one. It shifted its focus away from music for the time being and focused more of its efforts on video, of all things. In this version, it introduced the ability to play back and edit videos from within your session, albeit limited to files encoded within the specific QuickTime MOV codec wrapper, but nonetheless finally allowed composers to write to videos in real time as well as musicians to play back videos in real time with their music. To this day, with a strong enough computer, this can act as a pseudo SEMTI Resolume replacement if you're in a pinch. Another huge update to note in version 6 was the addition of four more EQ bands to the original EQ4, culminating in the new EQ8 device we know and love today. This version now required half a gigabyte of RAM, the first minimum requirement update since version 3. Version 7 was introduced November 29th, 2007 and was a huge release for Ableton and their pricing model reflected it. This was the first time we saw separate Ableton versions with the introduction of Suite, including more plugins, instruments, loops, and samples from the people at Ableton. This version also added the iconic drum rack, the industry leading and simplest sampler to this day, a device that allows users to trigger a sample for every MIDI note, offering up to 122 slots. Version 7 also introduced a native sidechain system, support for REX loops in form of importing and slicing, and introduced the analog, electric, and tension instruments included only within the new suite package. Ableton Live version 8 was released about two years after version 7, marking the longest gap in between Ableton releases up to this point. Version 8 was my first version of Ableton Live and the version I grew up on and first learned. I'm so nostalgic for this version and it's aesthetic for that reason and it'll forever have a place in my heart. This version ironically enough didn't introduce anything incredibly huge with most of its upgrades being on the subtle side. A few of these include improved warp algorithms, new filter types for operator, introducing fades on audio clips in arrangement view, introducing devices including multiband dynamics, frequency shifter, overdrive, and the iconic vocoder plugin, 
and added the groove engine and groove pull, including presets derived from drum machines like the MPC, but also let you extract grooves from audio clips of your own. About a year after Ableton Live 8's release, Ableton introduced Max for Live, a toolkit that allows developers to control the inner workings of Ableton, acting as a bridge into Max slash MSP, a development platform for audio software. There are some unfounded rumors that Ableton Live itself was developed originally in Max, but most of the current plugins included within the program to this day at least were developed in Max at some stage. And with that, I'm afraid that this old power book is no longer able to get upgraded to the next version. As Live 9 was an Intel release, Ableton Live 8 and Mac OS 10.5 8 Leopard was the last software that these guys could run in the Ableton universe. Rest in peace to an old friend. I had a G5 at a similar time, like I mentioned in the beginning, which is a similar machine to this. I remember feeling very sad when I lost software support for PowerPC back then. So with that, we're going to drag the file onto a flash drive that's plugged in over here and resume work over on the 2018 Mac Mini, which has 9, 10, and 11 beta installed. Goodbye, old friend. And this is where we hit the most annoying roadblock so far. So, so far I've been using this PowerBook G4 you saw in the previous shot, which is a PowerPC machine, meaning it can run version one through eight. And I planned, as I showed in the previous shot, to use my Mac Mini 2018 to continue where we left off with the PowerBook. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to me, Ableton Live 9 doesn't run in the version of Mac OS I run on this Mac Mini, which is Catalina, because Ableton Live 9 still relies on some 32-bit architecture to function, and Catalina removed all of that. So I'm in this weird predicament now where I have a computer that covers one through eight, and I have a computer that's slightly too new to cover nine. So nine is the only version of live that I can't run. So I was stuck on this issue for a few days. Even my old 2010 MacBook Pro is running Catalina, which no longer supports Ableton Live 9. And I was stuck on this for a few days until I thought to reach out to a friend of mine, 28 millimeter. He's a member of my arts collective, Gradient Collective, if you're interested in that project at all. Make sure to check the link in the description. And fortunately, he had a 2015 MacBook Pro that was still running Mojave, which is one of the last supported operating systems for Ableton Live 9. And with this, we carry on our journey on Christian's laptop. This is the point where I think many producers are familiar with how the Ableton story continues, but for sake of completion, we'll be covering every version of the program to date. Version 9 holds a very special place in my heart because it was the first version of Live that I made tutorials for, subsequently jumpstarting this channel, preparing me to create videos regularly for you about music production. Live 9 also powered a lot of my early live performances, a lot of my early DJ sets, and it's really important to me. The jump from Live 8 to Live 9 was a huge one, and rightfully so. Live 9 came out a whopping four years after its previous incarnation on March 5th, 2013 officially, and included a complete design overhaul and a ton of new features. One of the new features added was a new audio to MIDI function, which would convert audio of drums, melody, or a multi-voice harmony to MIDI. As expected, it's not entirely reliable, but I find it gets the bulk of the job done most of the time, with only small manual editing needed to polish the results. I still use it a lot today. MIDI received a ton of new editing options, the glue compressor device was added, and Max for Live was now included with the purchase of Live 9 Suite. This was also around the time I personally dove into Max for Live and all of its plugins and community, so it holds even more nostalgia for me for that reason. Version 9 also introduced Ableton's first hardware controller, the Ableton Push, effectively letting you touch your Ableton sessions 
which I think is still one of the best control interfaces on the market today. Strangely, Ableton released a huge incremental update to Live 9, Live 9.5, several years into its release. It could have honestly been its own version of Live entirely, I'm not 100% sure why they didn't, but my theory is that they were holding on to the Live 10 name for something truly revolutionary or special. In this incremental update, Live introduced a complete overhaul of Simpler, Waveforms received a total visual overhaul, Ableton Push received several updates, audio editing additions included reverse, one shot, 0.5 times and 2x warp modes, and slicing to a drum rack. Among the biggest and most exciting features of Live 9.5 was a new feature called Link, which allowed you to connect all of your devices in real time across different computers, phones, or other digital electronics. And around the same time, Ableton released their second MIDI controller, the Ableton Push 2, improving in every way on the original Push, including a full color display, better, more tactile buttons, and a lot more features. I have a lot of experience with this controller and it's still a staple in my live setup to this day. This is a version that I have no doubt almost anyone watching this video is familiar with as prior to February 23rd's release of Ableton Alive 11, it was the most current version of Live. Still, we'll cover some of the features added within Live 10 as it was a huge update for the software. Ableton Live 10 added a whole slew of new features. Some of my favorites are support for high DPI or retina displays as Apple calls them. A brand new visual system featuring vector design instead of bitmap making the program scale better at lower and higher resolutions. The introduction of many popular devices including Wavetable, a sort of native response to Xfer Serum and Native Instruments Massive. Drum Bus, a new device dedicated to processing drums, a first for Ableton. Echo, a new delay with many new features and pedal emulating classic distortions. Also included were many quality of life improvements, including capture to recall MIDI that was played if you forgot to press record, comparing MIDI clips that are stacked vertically, a feature I use almost every day, browser tags and favorites, overall improvements to many audio effects, groups and groups, groups and groups, improved metronome, the ability to encode MP3 and other file types, and a global automation switch. Live 10 was an absolutely massive release for Ableton and really affirmed its position as one of the industry leading DAWs on the market today. And now we arrive at today, the release of Live 11. There's a ton of videos covering the newest features of the newest revision, but some that I'm most excited about are vocal comping, the new MIDI system with MPE support, chance and randomization, and its much needed new CPU meter system. For a full rundown on all of the new features of Ableton Live 11, I'll link the official link to the Ableton website for it below, and a few videos about it, as unfortunately the Ableton website has a tendency to remove the what's new pages from earlier versions of Live upon every new release. I say this as someone who's had to really dig to find incremental improvements of every version of Ableton to make this video, though I'm sure Waymac Machine could probably find any of the previous pages you're looking for if you're watching this video upon the release of Live 12, 13, or any release in the future. I'm really excited about the launch of Live 11 and writing a ton of new music with it. I actually already gave my initial impromptu thoughts about the beta on a live stream a few weeks ago, and if you're interested in that, I'll link it in the description as well. I've had so much fun learning about the history of Ableton Live, a program that I and millions of others use every day. I've come to learn about every small change introduced into the program that at first seemed inconsequential, but in time amounted to much larger noticeable revisions that changed the way the program worked and how many people see it. I think one of the key takeaways I've learned over this journey is the value of these small changes. Small incremental improvements making something that we all love or have learned to love just marginally better. I think this is a great metaphor for art and its influence on the world. One small piece of art that took you five minutes to write, record, draw, paint, or otherwise create makes the world just a little bit better for the person the art meant something to. 
So I encourage you to keep creating beautiful music, art, and expressing yourself no matter how hard it seems at times, because no matter how small you think the work you create is, how inconsequential, all these small things can change the world for the better. I think the Ableton team knows the importance of what they do and how many millions of musicians around the world depend on the small changes they make to this incredible program. They've had a voice in the conversation of electronic music for many years, shaping the way the river of its progression has flowed since its inception. I'm always looking forward to their work, and I'm excited not only to look back, but to imagine what the future holds for Ableton Live. I'm Julian of Julian Gray Media. Thank you for watching, and I'll talk to you very soon. Bye-bye. So I know this really wasn't the focus of the video, but I'm sure some of you are wondering how this project file sounds, so I figured I'd play it for you. In terms of displays, they all have to all the plays. We have the first In terms of battery space, the iPhone, how do we stack up against this? Let's built take in. a look at weight. No, the we're 4.9 pounds. We can tell we've got a 56K modem built in, a USB port built in. Built in. And, <laughs> and we've got, <laughs> which some people like to do an indication. Now we okay, that's enough of that. I think there's a, a new genre somewhere in here, if you can fish it out. Apple Keynote Step. Thanks again, guys, for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to give it a like. It took a lot of work, and it's one of the biggest projects I've worked on in a long time. If you really enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel for future videos. And if you really liked it, check out my Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash Julian Gray. Any contributions are appreciated.